rotational motion is, uh, like I said, the climax of all chapters. The example that you have there, I'm sure you know what that is, do you? It's rotating. And when you look at that, you know that whenever an object is rotating, there is an axis of rotation. And in that case, the axis is passing straight through the middle, isn't it? So every rotating object has an axis of rotation. Now, if I open that door, will that be a rotating object? The answer is yes. Where is the axis? It's on the hinges. It's not making a full rotation. That doesn't matter. But isn't it making part of that rotation? So that's, again, a rotating object. When you open the cap of a water bottle, is that a rotating object? Yes, it is. So rotation, we see that in life all the time. Our Earth itself is rotating on its own axis, isn't it, as it goes around the sun? So right there, you have circular motion and rotational motion. And you see the difference, see? Circular motion is where the Earth is going around the sun in the elliptical orbit, but rotational motion is where it's going around on its own axis. So that's a combination. So we will have that type of motion as we go through the chapter. Another example that I can give you is a ball rolling down a ramp. Think about that, a ball rolling down a ramp. What is that? That's a combination again. Is the center of that ball rotating? The, the center of the ball, is it rotating as it comes down the ramp? Come on. The answer is no, the center is not rotating. The center is moving in a perfect straight line. Can you imagine that? The center is moving in a straight line. Isn't it at the same height from the ramp? Yeah. It's moving in a straight line, but the ball itself is rotating. So that is a combination of what? Linear motion and rotational motion. So you see that rotational motion can be combined with either circular motion or can be combined with linear motion. So we have a fantastic chapter ahead of us. And problems become a little bit complicated because of the combination of motion. Okay, so, but first some definitions. Usually I start with the definition of an angle because students don't realize what an angle is. An angle is the length of the arc divided by the radius. Length of the arc in this diagram, the length of the arc is S. S is the length of the arc. You can see that red part. And the radius is R. Therefore, the angle is S by R. So what is the unit of S? Arc length. That's measured in meter. Radius is also measured in meter, isn't it? That means angle technically has no units because both of these are measured in meters and the meter and the meter will cancel out. But there is a decorative unit for angle which we call radians. Remember in this chapter, you should never measure angle in degrees. There is no way. Angle must always be in radians. Take note of that. But then we need to know how to convert from uh, degrees to radians. I'm sure you know that 360 degrees is 2 pi radians. Did you know that? 360 degrees is 2 pi radians, which means 180 degrees is pi radians. So that will give you the ability to change from one into the other. In linear motion, we have heard of velocity. And we know that velocity is displacement over time. Do we know that? Velocity is displacement over time. But in rotation, velocity is replaced by angular velocity. So that's uh, the symbol, omega. Omega stands for angular velocity. And how is it defined? It's d theta by dt. d theta by dt. So. The angle divided by the time. 
And the unit of angular velocity is going to be, of course, radians per second, because angle is in radians, time is in seconds. So radians per second. So instead of meter per second, we have radians per second. See that? Omega is instead of velocity. OK, how do we define acceleration in linear motion? Isn't acceleration change in velocity by time? dv by dt is a. We're going to do the same thing here. Uh, there I'm just showing you how to change uh, radians into, I mean degrees into. Uh, radians, that's what I'm trying to show you there. Okay, so radians per second is the... All right, let's move on. Oh, I also wanted to give you another formula before I move on. This is an important one. Frequency, what is frequency? F there stands for frequency. Frequency is the rotations per second. Now, it's up to you how much you write, how much you understand is up to you. Frequency is rotations per second, RPS, rotations per second. How many times it rotates in one second? And if you have the frequency, you can find the angular velocity just by multiplying it with 2 pi. Why? How many radians is one rotation? One rotation. 2 pi radians, isn't it? One rotation, 360 degrees, 2 pi radians. So if it makes f rotations in one second, that means the total angle is 2 pi times f in one second. That's why it's omega. So that's a very important formula. So you can find omega by using d theta by dt or 2 pi times f, where f is radians per second. Are you getting me? Now, angular acceleration. Alpha. Alpha is, can you define alpha? You should be able to. Alpha is d omega by dt. d omega by dt. And the unit is going to be radians per second squared. Just like meter per second squared. So instead of meter per second squared, you have radians per second squared. Now, I'm going to compare linear motion with angular uh, rotational motion right there, you see. X is replaced by theta. V is replaced by omega. And alpha is in place of A. So for every quantity in linear motion, so X, displacement, theta, angular displacement, linear velocity, angular velocity, Linear acceleration, angular acceleration. Are you making that connection? Now remember that this acceleration is also called tangential acceleration. We will come to that in a minute. Uh, you remember the kinematics formulas? So you're going to have the same formulas here. Let's compare. Let's compare the formulas. So on the left-hand side, you have linear, right side, you have rotation. OK. I told you that could also be called tangential acceleration. See, A sub t. Do you remember a formula like this? Do you, by any chance? Of course. What would be the corresponding formula here? Omega, final, isn't it? Is equal to omega, initial? plus alpha t. So omega final, pick it up, Nathan. Omega final is equal to omega initial plus alpha t. And then you would have uh, this one. Remember, we used to call it the king. Does anybody remember the king? <laughs> OK. Or can you give me the equation for that? Just write down the equation below that. Go on, go on. Go on. What comes in place of x or delta x, somebody? Theta. Delta theta, right? OK. So delta theta is equal to omega naught t plus 1 half alpha t squared. So hope you make that connection. Then there is one like this. 
v sub f squared is equal to v naught squared plus 2a delta x. And that would be omega final squared is equal to omega initial squared plus 2 alpha delta theta. But I think I also give you another equation like this. Delta x is omega naught plus omega f divided by 2 times t. Did I? Oh, so that should be delta theta is omega naught plus omega f by 2 times t. Sorry, I got a, a little mixed up there, so I had to write delta theta. Now, this is in place of this one in linear motion, okay? And, of course, there should be time for some reason. There's no time here. It becomes more interesting now because it's 3D. And look at this. Didn't we define angle as S divided by R? But look, S is a vector, R is a vector. Both of them together are in the XY plane. Is this rotation clockwise or counterclockwise? Is this rotation clockwise or counterclockwise? Counterclockwise. And theta is up. So if you all just take your right hand up, hoping that you know your right hand, and hold, hold it like this, with the fingers showing the direction of rotation, the thumb will always give you the direction of the angle. Easy. So if it was rotating clockwise, theta would be down. That makes sense? All right, let's try it. When I open this door, when I open this door, what's the direction of angle when I open it? You got to say either up or down using the right hand rule. That's all I'm expecting you. You know how it's turning. Isn't it turning that way when I open it? And the thumb is surely up, so angle is up. But when I close the door, isn't it turning backwards? See, angle is down. That's very important. So two things. Number one, we use the right-hand rule to find the angle. Number two, angle is always perpendicular to the plane containing R and S. Did you notice? It's perpendicular. The only question is, is it up or down? It's always going to be at right angles to that plane. That is very important. Okay. So we're talking about a cross product here. We already talked about cross products when we did vectors, didn't we? A cross B is defined as AB sine theta. That's where we have I, J, K, unit vectors. We, we have talked about it. Okay, so I was trying to explain that there. We move it fast. I was trying to say, so 3I plus 4J plus 5K. If that's the vector. I was trying to explain something there, but don't worry about that. But just take a look at this. This is copied and pasted because I'm a little bit lazy sometimes. So if you do ds by dt, wouldn't you be doing d by dt of r theta? Don't simply copy. Try to understand. This is in your textbook because s is r theta, isn't it? Come on. But whenever you use calculus, what do you do with the constants? You always, or, or if both are variables, assuming that these two are variables, do you know how to do the differentiation? The product rule? I'm sure you know. Keep one constant, take the derivative of the first one, isn't it? Plus, keep the other constant, do the same with the second one. Come on, did you realize that? But when you look at these two terms, isn't the radius constant? When anything rotates, isn't the radius a constant? Therefore, what is dr by dt? If radius is constant, what is dr by dt? 
In other words, no. If radius is constant, how much does radius change with time? Zero. Oh, let me try that again. If radius is constant, how much does radius change with time? Zero. That's why the whole term becomes zero. You see that? So that leaves you with ds by dt is equal to what? Just this? Come on. And what is d theta by dt? Somebody. Velocity. Angular velocity, good. And what is ds by dt? Linear velocity. So just now we connected linear velocity with angular velocity. What is the formula we get? It's coming down under, right there. We got the formula, that's what we get. Linear velocity is the product of r and omega. Linear velocity is the product of r and omega. Now this is also called tangential velocity. Tangential, you know why? Because it's always along the tangent. That's why it's called the tangential velocity. Okay, uh, here's a question that I asked you. I told you that frequency is 120 RPM, but that doesn't sound right. Somebody tell me why. We never consider rotations per minute. We've got to change it into rotations per second. Now, here's where some students make a mistake. How do you change this? We know it's uh, 60 seconds is one minute, but some, unfortunately, they multiply. That is wrong. Because if something is making 120 rotations in a minute, it has to make a smaller number in a second, see? So when you do something, think about it. It's only making 120 rotations in a minute. In a second, it can only make two rotations. Did you understand? So when you do those conversions, if you are thinking, you will not make a mistake. Okay, so F is actually 120 divided by 60 RPS, that is two rotations per second. Once you get F, you can find omega, because I told you omega is what? Two pi times F, is it? Yeah, so that means it's two pi times two, which is four pi, and the unit is radians per second. So that's how we get omega. And once you get omega, you can find the linear velocity because it's r times omega. And uh, I think I told you that the radius is 10 centimeters, but centimeter doesn't work, so change it into meter, 0 0.1 meter. And then all you got to do is 0 0.1 times uh, 4 pi, which is how much? Did anybody get the answer to that? 0 0.1 times 4 pi? How much? 1.26 and the unit would be? Meter per second, because it's linear velocity. So there we have connected linear velocity with angular velocity. I think this is the best time to ask you another question. So, as you are still paying attention, here it is. So let's consider that it's a disk that is rotating. This time it's a disk, and that's the axis of rotation. And it is rotating at this omega. What is the omega, four pi? So this disk is rotating at that angular speed, okay? And I take two points on this disk. One point is very close to the axis. A, uh, the other point, B, is further away. So this one has a radius R A. This one has a radius R B. I want to ask you this, and be careful when you answer. All right, think. That means just think. Assume that it's rotating counterclockwise. Here is the question. What is the angular velocity of particles A and B? Do both have the same angular velocity, 4 pi radians per second? For some reason, students struggle there. That's why I'm asking you. Do both particles A and... Is the question clear? 
do both the particles A and B have the same angular velocity? Yes, yes. The answer is yes. All particles in a rotating object have the same angular velocity. Yeah, because by the time A completes one circle, doesn't B also complete a circle? Yeah. But their linear velocities are not the same. Which one has a bigger linear velocity? B, because it's making a bigger circle. That should make sense, because what's the relation between them? The relation is linear velocities are times omega. So although omega is the same, since the radius is not the same, the one that has the bigger radius will always have the bigger linear velocity. Did you understand? Simple. Don't, don't, just, don't just confuse ourselves and blame physics for that. Because I'm explaining everything clearly. So I will use this same example to ask you another question and be with me. Okay, the disk is rotating and it's rotating with a constant angular velocity omega. All right? So omega is constant, it's like constant. Let's focus on particle A, just particle A. And I want to ask you this. Does particle A have any acceleration? I, well, I said that omega is constant. So if I had asked you, does it have angular acceleration, the answer would have been no. Alpha is zero, isn't it? Because what is alpha? Alpha is d omega by dt. Omega is not changing, so alpha is zero. Agreed? But there is another acceleration. Who can remember? Thank you. Centripetal acceleration. Now, what's the direction of centripetal acceleration? Towards the center, along the radius. And we used to represent that with what? Symbol is A sub R. Correct? A sub R. So, whenever an object rotates, even if the angular velocity is constant, it's always going to have the radial acceleration or centripetal acceleration. You can also have it as A sub C. And what's the formula for that? V squared by R, isn't it? And what is that velocity there? Oh, we're talking about the tangential velocity, see? Be careful. Now I'm going to add something more. I'm going to add something more. Now let's imagine, you see how much you have to listen? Now let's imagine that it's speeding up, like it's a ceiling fan. When you switch on a ceiling fan, doesn't it pick up speed? Like, of course. Omega changes, right? Omega changes. When omega changes, alpha is no longer zero. That means it has another acceleration, AT. It has a tangential acceleration now because the tangential velocity is changing. And what's the relation? It's going to be R alpha. Just like R omega. Compare. Compare both. It's a perfect comparison, isn't it? We went from angular velocity to linear velocity. How? Multiplying it with the radius. Do the same. We go from angular acceleration to linear acceleration. Multiply with the radius. So that's what we're going to get next. So remember there are two accelerations. One is tangential, the other is along the radius. Let me draw it for you. Then you will understand. Okay, I have a diagram there, but I'll draw another one. Okay. So that's rotation. You have a tangential acceleration and you have a radial acceleration. That should be at 90 degrees corrected. Or maybe I should do a better job. That's better. Oh, okay. So that is A T. This is A R. So there is a tangential acceleration, there is a radial acceleration. We, again, to remind you, which one is always going to exist? The radial acceleration is always going to be there, but tangential acceleration? Only if omega is changing. Okay, let's move on. And that is what I've tried to bring out here. All right, so take a look at this. 
little bit of calculus, but calculus is just used to get the idea. We already did that, didn't we? Did that. Didn't I tell you all this? Yeah. But why did I write it? Just to show you this. Just like S was the cross product of theta and R, linear velocity is the cross product of omega and R. Write that one. Just, you just need to write this. Linear velocity is the cross product of omega and R. Hey, in a cross product, does the order matter? Yes. yes, so be careful. So don't put it as R cross omega. That would be negative of the velocity. So be careful with the order. Okay. Moving on. Even without me talking, you should understand that. Again, it's a product function, isn't it? Do the same thing. Keep omega constant dr by dt plus r constant d omega by dt, but dr by dt is zero. Therefore, you get this. On the left side, what do you have? Acceleration. D omega by dt is alpha. That's how we get that relation. I told you that relation, didn't I? A sub t is r alpha. So now we have all the three. I'm just adding. So now we got the third one, and it's another cross product. Acceleration. Linear acceleration is the cross, cross product of angular acceleration and the radius. Wow, that's three important cross products right there. Uh, there's one more chance, so I'm going to review this. This is the right-hand rule. In this case, it's giving us the direction of angular velocity. Did you notice that? It's giving us the direction of angular velocity. So I want to ask you a question and try to answer this. Use the right-hand rule and answer this question. Somebody's riding a bicycle, and the person is, dry, is riding to the north. To the north. What's the direction of angular velocity? Think before you answer. A person is riding a bicycle to the north. What's the direction of angular velocity? Did you understand that if a person is riding a bicycle to the north, then the angular velocity is to the west? Did you understand that using the right hand rule? You are good. Let's move on. Okay, so that is, again, the same thing that is shown there. Take a look. I don't want to go too fast. Velocity, radius, and you get omega, isn't it? That's the right hand rule. But look at this. Isn't it turning in the opposite direction now? Like clockwise, and angular velocity is now downwards? All right, I think we spent enough time there. But this is a little different. Take a look at these two pictures. It's a little different. It's not vectors anymore, but this is a disk, and the rotation rate, counterclockwise, is increasing. It's rotating faster and faster, counterclockwise, all right? Isn't alpha in the same direction as omega then? Yes, but what if it's still spinning counterclockwise, but the rotation rate is decreasing, like it's slowing down? What's the direction of omega? Still up, but what's the direction of alpha? Down. Did you understand that? It's just like when you're driving to the north, you step on the brakes, isn't your linear acceleration to the south? Oh. Because you're slowing down. But if you're driving north and you step on the gas, then your acceleration in the, is in the same direction as the velocity. See, it's also north. Same thing. There are so many things, and uh, it's, uh, it's not confusing if you understand each step. Otherwise, it's confusing. All right. And we know alpha is d omega by dt. I told you all that, but I'm trying to put something else there. I, I put it as d squared theta by dt squared. Would that make sense? Because what is omega? d theta by dt? So it's d by dt of d theta by dt. So that gives us a second order differential. See? That's where you begin learning about differential equations. 
Have you heard about differential equations? Yes. We're going to use that in physics. Differential equations in physics, but at the basic level here. But as you go higher, like if you're trying to get a master's in physics, that's when you would use all of this at the higher level. But we get introduced to everything, okay, right here. So we've talked about all that. So here is the complete comparison of linear motion with rotational motion. Complete comparison. We had written the equations before, you remember that? I wrote it again just to just as a review of this section. S theta, velocity omega, A alpha, here are the relations between them. You see that? And then the kinematic equations brings us to the end of section two introduce a new quantity called rotational inertia in this section. Rotational inertia. Have we heard of inertia? All right. Remind me, what is inertia? A moving object continue, yeah, wants to stay in motion and an object at rest wants to stay at rest. Isn't that inertia? Oh, I think I asked you this question. Bad example, but you may remember on a fast moving bus there is a heavier person and a lighter person. You remember that? Mm -hmm. And the bus is suddenly stopped, and who has a greater fall? The heavier person. Why? Because the heavier person has a bigger inertia. Why does that uh, heavier person have a bigger inertia? Because the person's mass is bigger. I'm telling you a very important thing now. In linear motion, inertia depends on mass. Write that down. In linear motion, Inertia depends on mass. So now, in rotation, what does inertia depend on? That's the question, okay? Now look at me. If you have a small ceiling fan and a bigger ceiling fan, and all other conditions are the same, and you switch them off, now imagine that they were both rotating at the same speed, okay? small ceiling fan and a big one, and you switch them off, which one will continue rotating for a longer time before it stops? Easy. Which one? The bigger one. The bigger one, the bigger one will continue rotating for a longer time before it stops. That means it has a bigger rotational inertia. Why? Is its mass bigger than that of the smaller ceiling fan? Technically, yes. But let me change something. Let me say that these fans are made of different materials. So the bigger one is made of aluminum, and the smaller one is made of wood. Are you with me? So much so that both have the same mass. Is that possible? Yeah. Smaller one is made of wood. Or it might be thicker, blades, whatever. So they have the same mass. Now, go back to the same question. They are both rotating at the same speed. You switch them off. Which one will come to rest, taking a longer time? Will your answer change? The masses are the same. The masses are the same, agree? So are you still going to say that the longer one will rotate for a bigger time? Is that what you? Yes. If so, you're right. But then we have a problem. That means rotational motion or rotational inertia does not just depend on the mass, because the masses are equal. It also it depends on the distribution of the mass. It's like center mass, right? Center mass. Correct. It's in the bigger one, isn't the mass distributed further away from the axis? Can you get? Can you get what I'm trying to say? So remember that and write it down. Rotational inertia depends on three things. Rotational inertia depends on, number one, the rotational inertia depends on the total mass, of course. Number one, the total mass. Got to be riding faster too, okay? Number two, on the distribution of the mass. On the distribution of the mass. And number three, I was looking for some object. Number three, on the position of the axis. On the position of the axis. Okay, uh, so imagine that this is rotating 
about if I put a rod here and you know that's the axis it can rotate this way, isn't it? But can't I make it rotate about uh, another axis? Sure, I can. Like I can keep it this way, make a drill a hole through this, pass a stick through this or a rod, and make it rotate that way, can't I? Come on. Will it have the same rotational inertia? The mass is the same, it's the same object. The answer is no, because rotational inertia also depends on the position of the axis of rotation. You see that? Is it like this? Is it like that? Now when you look at bicycle tires, car tires, you know that the axis is passing right through the center of mass, don't we? So what are we trying to do there? First of all, if it's not, it will be ugly motion. When you drive your car, you won't drive for too long if it's not passing through the center. <laughs> so number one. Number two, we're trying to have minimum rotational inertia there. So when does an object have minimum rotational inertia? When the axis is passing right through the center. I gave you another point. Right through the center of mass. If the axis is right through the center of mass, it has minimum rotational inertia. I feel like asking you another question, very simple, connected to what we've been discussing, but very important. Let's say we have a disc and a ring. You know the difference? A disc and a ring, both having the same mass, and both rotating about an axis through the center. Their sizes are the same. All right, are, we with, are you with me? Disc and ring, they have the same size, but you know a ring has all the mass like I'm kind of giving out the answer now. All the mass is situated away from the axis. Okay, so if these two are compared, surely you should be able to tell me which one has a bigger rotational inertia now. Ring. Yes or no, which one, disc or ring? ring? The ring. So think about the bicycle wheel now, the bicycle tire. Now we may think that when we, when we use, when engineers use those spokes, you know those, you may think it's for decorative purposes. No, 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 no. See, what they're trying to do is they're trying to situate the mass near the rim. You got it. They are trying to say, let this thing have the highest rotational inertia. Why? Because once it rolls, you should be able to stop pedaling in between, and you want the bicycle not to stop. Don't you want it to continue moving? Isn't that what happens? Like you pedal and you stop. Does the bicycle stop immediately? No, because it has a high rotational inertia. Did you get it? So that's what they're trying to do. Okay, think about cars. You know, even those stylish, fantastic ones on the alloy wheels, you have heard about it? Why? So they're trying to make the central part light while the, you know how heavy a tire is? Have you tried lifting a tire? Man, it's heavy. But where is the mass? Where is most of the mass situated? It's near the edges. What am I trying to say? I'm trying to drive this idea that rotational inertia depends on the distribution of the mass. The further the mass is distributed from the axis, the bigger the rotational inertia. Did you get it? So now we have the math backing it up. How do we define rotational inertia? All right, day two. I said day two. I taught this on day two. <laughs> That's in summer. I'm starting with kinetic energy, something that you know, because you know that kinetic energy is one half mass times velocity squared. Don't we know that? Yeah, we do. So to get to the math, I'm using this technique, just substitutions, and you will understand. I'm just going to substitute for velocity. We all know that velocity is r omega. So since velocity is squared, I have to square both, right? Okay. And yeah, that's the reason. Velocity is r omega. That's why. And this is this is just for a particle, isn't it? When you consider a rotating object, aren't there so many particles in the rotating object? There are. So how do you find the total kinetic energy? This is just the kinetic energy of one particle. How do you find the total kinetic energy? Add add all the kinetic energies. That's called summation. Have you heard of summation, sigma? That's what we're gonna do. So for a rigid object, because we want to find the total kinetic energy, you got to take sigma of that, one half mi ri squared omega. You know that i stands, sub i stands for the ith particle, right? 
considering all the particles. Okay, when you do a summation, just like integration, you take the constants out. Which is the constant here? Ah. You see, mass is just imaginary. We're considering that each particle has a different. What about omega? Do you all remember that? I told you, when something is rotating, all particles have the same. Don't look at me like that, didn't I tell you? Rotation also. Yeah, all have the same omega. So take it out. So omega is going to be taken out and then take the summation of everything else. Because it's a square, it's omega squared taken out. And then you have sigma mi r i squared. Okay, half is a constant too, so yeah, it's taken out. This quantity, it's called moment of inertia. This is the quantity that's called moment of inertia. We're going to use the symbol I, caps I. That is moment of inertia. Some textbooks call it rotational inertia. So that is rotational inertia or moment of inertia. The unit is kilogram meter squared. What is it? Write this down. Okay. I know I have that. Interesting? No? In linear motion, if the mass is bigger, the inertia is bigger. Isn't it? In rotational motion, if the rotational inertia is bigger, then the inertia is bigger. All right, here is the deal, and very, very important. In whatever, whatever role mass plays in linear motion, the same part is played by rotational inertia in rotational motion. That makes sense. One more time. Or I, it'll make sense if I give you a formula. Who remembers the formula for linear momentum? It was just last chapter. Linear momentum, what is it? P is equal to what? Ma <laughs> Mass times velocity. Right? P is equal to mass times velocity. In rotation, I can give you now the formula for angular momentum. It's easy. I omega. Or make the connection quick. Make the connection quick. In linear motion, P is mass times velocity, right? In rotational motion, L, angular momentum, is I times omega. Are you making the connection yet? Okay, wait. Kinetic energy, we just used that, but I'll, I'll, I'll do that again. Kinetic energy. Ha one half mass times velocity squared. That's in linear motion. Rotation. All right, let me put T and R. What's the formula? Can somebody help me? Imagine that I forgot. Somebody help me. I, okay. Omega squared. See that? So now you see that wherever mass comes in linear motion, you're going to have I. Wherever mass appears, you're going to have I. Got it? But there is a problem. There is a big problem. Watch. I want to move this object. No. Let me put it this way. I want to rotate this object. Everybody watch. Because it's fun watching. I want to rotate this object, okay? Is it rotating? No. Oh, it's moving in a straight line. But what happens if I apply the force off the center? It rotates. I'm applying a force, correct? As long as I apply the force in line with the axis or the center, it's going to have linear motion. Do you see this? But if I apply the force off the axis or the center, it's going to rotate. And maybe it'll also move. It's a combination motion. 
So whatever part force plays in linear motion, there is a new quality called torque that's going to come in in rotation. So everybody write torque. And torque is represented by the Greek symbol tau, or T-A-U, tau. That's how you say it. It's a vector, just like force. So force is a vector. Torque, tau, is a vector. It's actually written like this, like that. Yeah. Torque, tau. Uh, what is the formula for force that you know? All right, good. Force is mass times acceleration. Can you or somebody give me the formula for torque? Let's see who will get it first. Torque. I was fast. Who was that? Very good. Who's this? I alpha. Once again, you see that whatever, wherever mass comes in, I comes in. And this is linear acceleration, so it's angular acceleration, isn't it? It's not so tough. But I want you to know the definition of torque. Just, not just this. This is, of course, this is one formula. But let's try it. Let's try it. Watch again. What is the torque? Zero. Zero. Why? Because I'm applying the force right at the center. If I move it off, isn't there going to be some radius there? Like if I apply the force so that you can see. If I apply the force here, isn't there a distance between the center and where I'm applying the force? That's the radius. So what is torque? Torque is the cross product of R and F. Oh, did you hear me? Watch. Isn't the radius that way? Like radius that way? Imagine I'm applying the force here. I'm applying the force here. You saw that? So the radius is that way. Force is this way. What direction is it turning? Clockwise or counterclockwise? Counter. The way I showed you. Look. What's the direction of torque? Same right hand rule. So what is torque again? Torque is R cross F. Write it down. Well, in the college physics class, I would say this is R F sine theta, which is also true for you, of course. And I want to demonstrate something, which you probably know. I was doing this yesterday, and people were all over the outside. There was a professor walking out there. Is this thing crazy over here? I am. All right, I want to open the door. I want to open the door. Everybody knows that it's easiest to open the door by applying the force, the farthest from the hinges. Doesn't everybody know that? Well, if you don't, you should come here and try to open the door applying a force here. I can't. Because it takes a definite torque to open it, correct? So the torque has a constant number. You can get that torque either by applying a small force at a big distance or by applying a again, huge force at a small distance. Does that make sense? It's so tough to hold it. If I try moving a little closer, I'm gone. That's why I'll never forget this that happened in life. I, there are so many instances that I'll never forget. One of it is teaching you. That's a joke. Anyway, uh, I had a puncture one time. Long story short, in 30 seconds, I had a puncture one time. And uh, it's, uh, this is in India, driving, of course, and I had forgotten to take the tire rod. So I have the spare tire, everything, but I can't change it because I don't have the tire rod. So I had to wave, you know, somebody stopped and helped me or gave his tire rod, changed, put the spare tire, forgot about it, and then I had to go, you know, spare tire, you can't drive with that for too long. So I had to remove that. It would never come off. I could not get the spare tire off, and then I remembered. This guy who helped me was driving a huge truck. I was trying, driving a tiny car. So the tire rod was much bigger. 
And he had used that, we both had used it, to tighten the bolts. Now I was using my smaller tie rod. Do you all get what I'm trying to say? The length of the handle is smaller, so the torque is not enough. I had to hammer it to get the bolt loose. I technically had to hammer it. I hope you understood. I'll never forget that. Well, I'm always teasing physics, but you know, at that time you are stressed out. You're not thinking about, it's a longer, so you gotta apply a smaller force. You're not thinking about all that stuff. Let's go, when you're tightening it. And, oh my goodness. Haven't you seen uh, pipe wrenches that come in different sizes? Screwdrivers that come in different sizes. Now I'm talking about the tip. Well, when the tip is bigger, the handle is also bigger, usually. Now, do you know why the tip is bigger? So it can give a bigger torque. Let me teach you how to open a water bottle. You really do not know. Believe me, you don't know. You're not thinking about the technique of what you're doing. It comes automatically. But what we're doing is this. With this finger, you're applying a force that way. With the thumb, you're applying a force in the opposite direction. Isn't that true? Now you know how to open a water bottle. See, with this finger that way, the thumb this way, correct? And the forces are technically the same. Same force. So how would you calculate the torque required in this case? If I give you that the force is like 10 newtons that way, 10 newtons this way, and the diameter of the cap is two centimeters. But here's a problem. Since we have a problem, let's do it. So we have a problem. I just, I just magnified it. So with this, I'm applying a force here. With this, I'm applying a force there. And assume that the forces are both 10 newtons. And this is, did I say? I said two centimeters, didn't I? Okay. Calculate the torque. And now uh, there is a little bit of confusion. I already heard, I think Nathan say, would you add them up or something to that effect? You said something, yeah. So there, is, there are many thought processes. Anybody else has another thought process? How would you find the torque? What is theta in this case? Theta. All right, you remember R F sine theta? Theta is the angle between R and F. Hello? What is the angle between radius and force here? Oh, it's not on my face, it's here. 90. Do you all see it? The angle between, so sine 90 is maximum, so it's usually torque is RF whenever theta is 90. So R times it. But what is the value of R? Huh? Surely one centimeter, because radius is one. Okay, what is the value of F? Huh? No. No. Ten. So whenever you calculate the torque, remember you only consider one force. I'm going to give you the reason, because that's a little confusing. Before you ask me, I'm going to give you the reason. Can't even write now. Well, I changed the one centimeter into meter. Did you all notice that? 0 0.01 times. So you got one Newton meter. The unit of torque is Newton meter. I'm, I'm going to give you the reason, then I'll give you a chance to ask. Now, why am I only using one foot? Think about opening this door. You may think there's only one force here, but you are wrong. You are thinking, oh, he's applying a force. But by Newton's third law, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. When I apply a force here, immediately at the hinges, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Are you with me? So if I apply 20 Newtons here, there is 20 Newtons at the hinges opposite. Did we consider both in this case? No. I hope you understood, did you? You always consider only one force because of that reason. And uh, it's right before you. Six washers are spaced 10 centimeters apart on a rod of negligible mass, are rotating about a vertical axis. Find the rotational inertia of this system if each washer has a mass of 10 grams. Come on. Each washer 
has a mass of 10 grams. Go ahead, try to do it. Exactly. You got to find the rotational inertia of each one and add them up. That's why we always write I as sigma m r squared, isn't it? So you take the mass of each one, multiply it with the square of the radius of each one, get all those six, add all the six. That's what you got to do. Even if you don't do the math, I hope you understand what we're doing. Okay, so the mass here is 0 0.01 kilogram. Is that, is that correct? 10 divided by 1,000? Okay. And what is the distance? What is this distance from the diagram? What do you think it is? 15? Mm -hmm. No. Isn't it 25? 25 from the axis of rotation, because you have 10, 10, and 5. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, that's okay, 0.25 meter, right? So, what is the rotational inertia of that one? That one would be, come on now, 0 0.01 times 0 0.25 squared, which gives you something. Why is this? What is gone? Six point two five? Is that right? Huh? No. What do you get? Nobody's talking. What do you get? Too small. Hazes, what did you get? How much? Okay. 6.25 times 10 to the negative 4, and the unit would be kilogram meter squared. How would you find the next one? I'm not going to do everything. It's, it's just wasting time. How would you do this one? 0.01 times, what's the distance? 0.15, isn't it? 0.15, so you would do 0.01 times 0.15 squared. Huh? Okay, let's go ahead, do that also. Come on, tell me. 0.01 times, if you can quickly tell me, please. How much do you get for that? 0 0.25 times 10 to the negative. Oh, say it loudly. 2.25 times 10 to the 94. Thank you. All right, one more to go. We just need to find one more. What is this distance? Five centimeter. So that would be what? 0 0.01 times five centimeters, so 0 0.05 squared. Uh, how much is that? Two point five times ten to the negative five kilogram meter squared. Or right, add all these three numbers. And some of you are like, are you forgetting the washers on the other side? No, I'm not. Just add these two, these three, and tell me. Do you get 8.75 times 10 to the negative 4? So total 8.75 times 10 to the negative 4. Is that the answer? No. What do I need to do? Multiply it by 2. Will that work? Because it's symmetric, right? So whatever you got on the side, when you get the same on the side, so multiply it with 2. So times 2 will give you 17.5. So the answer is 17.5 times 10 to the negative 4 kilogram meter squared. I think you understood how to find the rotational inertia of an object. But can we do this for a big disk? Yeah, but it would take a while. 
<laughs> it will, I mean, you'll have to take. Therefore, here is the method to find out the rotational inertia of a disk. And we are going to use, this is section three, this is the next day, but we're just going into this to give you an idea of how we would use calculus and get the formula for rotational inertia of a disk. That's all we need to do. We'll prove it the next day. So if you have a disk and it's spinning about its axis, uh, so you understand that M is the mass and R is the radius of the disk. Do you get that? Now all you got to do is M R squared by two. But don't you want to know how we go from one to the other? That's where we have to absolutely use calculus and get it the next day. So some parts we cannot do with, without calculus. And we will also find the rotational inertia of other objects, like a rod. If you have a rod, and uh, if you are rotating it about an axis through the center, what's the rotational inertia? What is the rotational inertia of a sphere? See where we're going? Disc, ring, rod, sphere, we'll get all that. And then a little bit of angular momentum, and we will be done the next day.